this is Nicewander, and welcome to the Now Man Show. I am here today with Dr. Elizabeth Ryder, George Callas, and also Eric Boyd. Dr. Elizabeth Ryder has been a mechanic and a small business owner, a university teacher, an anthropologist, and database analyst and computer programmer. She has also been a lifelong social justice, environmental, and human rights activist and has been involved in both community and political organizing. She has worked for organized labor over two decades, having worked with both SEIU and AFSCME, ASME. She has been involved in cooperatives since the early 1970s and co-chairs the Union Co-op Council for the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. Plus, she's the organizer for Lucy, the Los Angeles Union Cooperative Initiative, she is a graduate of the University of California, Los Angeles. Professor George Callas teaches political science, history, and government at the Miramar Community College in San Diego. He's also the political research consultant and executive producer of financial related productions of the WSDE, Worker Self Directed Enterprise, Arite Media Productions, and is the lead for Democracy at Work San Diego. Eric Boyd is a lifelong athlete and a coach, competing and coaching currently in CrossFit and weightlifting. He is also a co-owner of Interactive Fitness Systems, a local gym that is working towards becoming a worker cooperative and is working to form another co-op, the Platform Co-op Investment Club, an international investment club looking to help platform startups which wish to incorporate cooperative principles. He's also the co-lead for Democracy at Work Pasadena. Before we get started into this discussion, we are going to talk about, as you can probably guess from the introduction, worker cooperatives, or more specifically, worker self-directed enterprises. Let's watch a video with Professor Richard Wolf. This is Richard Wolf with another Econo Minute. I want to talk to you briefly about economics, democracy, and the way we do business. I want to make a simple point. If you believe in democracy, as I suspect most of us do, then you know it means, basically, that if you are affected by a decision, you have the right to participate in it. You know, that's the idea about our political system. Since we are affected by the decisions made by mayors and senators and governors and presidents, well, we participate in their decisions by having the authority to hire and fire them, to vote for them, or to vote against them. At least we have some participation in the decisions. But it is not that way in capitalist enterprises. In those, here's the typical story. A tiny group of people at the top, the owner, the management that the owner chooses, or in a modern corporation, the major shareholders, usually a dozen or so institutions or people who decide who is on the board of directors, that's usually 15 or 20 people, and they make all the key decisions. They decide what to produce, how and where, and what to do with the products of the labor of all the people. And what about all the people who work in an enterprise? They have no participation at all. They are excluded from deciding what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits and the net revenue. That's not a democratic system. But there is a democratic way of organizing an economy, and it's not capitalism. It's called worker cooperatives, and it's an old idea whose time has come. Here's how it works. All the people who work in an enterprise, all of them, one person, one vote, they make the decisions democratically. What to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits that, after all, they've all helped to produce. It would change our economic system. It would democratize not just the enterprises, but the system as a whole. It's long overdue. It's what democracy means when you bring it to the economy, which we should have done long ago. This is Richard Wolf for Econo Minute. All right. 
Worker Self-Directed Enterprise. That is a business that's owned, as you saw in the video there, owned and run by all the workers. Then that means basically one person is has one vote. And if you choose to have stocks, then you also have one stock per vote, right? That's not necessarily uh, what you find in corporate uh, environments, believe me, I know. So there's also no um, external investors or managers, everything you know, is done, the most important decisions particularly, if not all of them, are made by everybody within the organization. You can hire and fire who you want, you, you know, you decide again, democratically. Uh, what happens with the surpluses and the losses, again, democratically. So you decide whether or not to keep operations in the community, you know, and it's always people before profits, which uh, Wolf, Professor Wolf has talked about extensively. So uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about um, the different types of cooperatives, you know, here with the team. And uh, we want to make sure everybody's aware. Before we get into the nitty gritty, we want to discuss that. There's, there's a lot to talk about. And um, starting off uh, with just the basic idea of worker cooperatives, as we, you've already learned, hopefully, one person, one vote, democratic decision making in business. And everybody owns the business. Now, there are different types. And, and the reason why uh, Professor Wolf talks about worker self-directed enterprises is to dis distinguish those from the different types of cooperatives. Because when they're worker directed, that means we make the decisions in the workplace where we work, okay? So there's other types like um, housing co-op. Like there's an example, correct, Elizabeth, uh, here in LA? LA uh, Eco Village. It's, yes. uh, they do a land trust and all, that, all of it is owned uh, you know, by everybody that lives there. And uh, they have meetings and they decide democratically uh, all the decisions that have to be made to run their housing cooperative. LA Eco Village. And if you live in the local area, you should definitely try to visit it. They do, on Sundays, they do tours. It's quite uh, an operation. And I think you have to make reservations ahead of time. You yes, know, you to, do. To go, go to the website. With, with Lois Arkin. Lois Arkin. Yeah. She's my idol. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I want to meet Lois Arkin when I grow up. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, projects like that are so important right now, especially when we have. Uh, you know, uh, speculation on uh, on rental properties um, be at an all-time high, um, yes, especially right. from foreign entities buying up rental right. properties. Yes. And so, uh, from what I understand, those are typically m less expensive than their, I guess you could say, capitalist counterparts. Uh, well, yes, living in a, um, in a housing cooperative, yes, you're working together to have ownership. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is a true danger in our society right now, the fact that we're losing ownership yeah. of our land yeah. and uh, our yes. economy. We've lost ownership of our economy. That and now, as you ago. said, many, so many speculators coming from overseas and buying up the housing you know, in Los Angeles, it's a real concern. There's a housing crisis in, in Los Angeles. There is. Yeah. And uh, people are speculating and uh, buying up the land, and soon we will not own our own housing. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Well, you know, a lot of uh, uh, capitalism basically uh, have moved overseas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, while uh, China's economy is, I guess, relatively stable or something like that, uh, so when you have people coming here buying up the property, um, there's a lot of uh, right. Chinese investors coming into mm -hmm. Southern California and all over the place now. Just like in, in Hawaii, you know, when, when the Japanese started buying up stuff there, you know, during their economic boom, mm -hmm. you know, and you see a lot of Japanese people in Hawaii. Well, that's how that happened. Well, it goes deeper into, you know, income inequality because the average income in Los Angeles is $50,000 a year. That, yeah. The average price of a house is 400000 You yeah. cannot qualify. Mm -hmm. The average wage earner <coughs> cannot qualify to buy the average house. Now, wouldn't that, that average, though, because that's a whole other topic we yeah. get into, but isn't that average? I always thought about, I hear that, like, $50,000 is the average. Isn't that, like, if you count Absolutely. all the, the, the multi-millionaires you know, included in that mix? Because if you, if you cut out household income also, which means you're counting um, those, are, that's multiple incomes. That's yeah. two parents both yeah. holding sometimes two jobs mm -hmm. yeah. to support themselves and their children. Wow. But if you were to cut so. out the multi-millionaires, let's say, yeah. and the millionaires here in the L.A. area, I think that figure would go down yeah. drastically in an average, personally. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think. So essentially, it's, it's a privatization of housing mm -hmm. as yeah. opposed to yeah. bringing people together into ownership. Right. So that would be essentially uh, part of the neoliberal project where you privatize the public domain 
and housing, health, and so yeah. forth. So all these things are tied together. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Consumer cooperatives are owned and controlled by people who, who buy goods and services. Uh, here in North Pasadena, there was a food co-op store. It's no longer open, sadly. It was a nice little place. But you had to be a member to go in there and buy the food, the organic food that you know came from more local uh, growers. There's also REI, which is a recreational company. Um, now there's producer, agricultural, and marketing cooperatives. And I know Elizabeth, you you kind of put the uh, uh, in the agricultural and the marketing together. Could you explain a little bit about that? Well, you take an organization like uh, Sunkiss. There's, I, I believe it's 49 producers. They each own their own farm, but they come together under the name of Sunkist mm -hmm. uh, to market so their product. Mm -hmm. So yes, they are do producing agricultural produce, but they come together as a cooperative uh, to, um, to market their product. So, so, so the yeah. California cheese companies like that too? Or yeah, it's companies? marketing. Yeah. Uh, cooperative and um, the other types of cooperatives here. There's many cooperatively owned businesses, but mm -hmm. only worker cooperatives are solve the labor problems because only worker cooperatives are the ones that you know actually the workers are uh, democratically in control. So mm -hmm. you, you take even co opportunity market in Santa Monica. Uh, it's a wonderful market and they do very good things, but the people that work there are not the members. It's the consumers that buy there that are the members of the cooperative. Mm -hmm. So you can have just as many uh, labor problems with. With, um, with cooperative businesses, oh. if it's not a worker cooperative, as any business. That's that's mm -hmm. very true. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also the purchasing cooperative, which again is not a WSDE. Um, and, and what what is exactly a purchasing cooperative? How does that differ from a consumer? Well, they're kind of the same thing. Kind I mean, it, thing. you know, it's a buying group. Uh, I was a member of something way back in the um, early 70s called the Free Venice Food Conspiracy. We met at a, <laughs> a Methodist church, Ocean Park Methodist Church, and we were a buying club. We'd get together and, and combine our list of groceries for that week and then buy as a group, a buying group, and uh, then redistribute it. So it's just a buying group. It's I the see. same thing as a consumer cooperative. And I, I've heard of, I have Israeli friends that have, uh, one that even talked to me about actually living as a child, living mm -hmm. on a kibbutz. Yes. What, what is that exactly? Well, it's a, a farming cooperative, but you know, it, it, in, in it's, like, uh, it's like the housing cooperative. Um, but you also have, my, one of my favorites, cooperative child care is part of it. Oh, wow. Yes, right. and wow. cooperative education, you know, cooperative schools. That's so a um, it's a combined. Uh, They've been around since the 19, yeah. early 1900s. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's one of the success stories. Yeah. And, and I know and here, and here in Los Angeles, there's an artist's community mm -hmm. at uh, what used to be the old Pabst Brewery downtown, oh, the yeah. L.A. Brewery, because you know, I love, love going there for their art walks twice a year. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, what kind of uh, cooperative is that? Uh, yeah. You know? Well, again, you know, I'm <laughs> borders on yeah. being sort of a marketing cooperative, it right? Because yeah. you have independent yeah. producers bringing their their what they produce on their own together to just for the the gallery, just for um, showing it. And uh, Native American communities do this also. In New Mexico, there's a number of where the tribes come together. They have a store. They bring all of their um, you know jewelry that they make and they market it together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. a cooperative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right by Albuquerque. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I've heard of that actually. Yeah. Because I was when I went through the Amtrak train there, mm -hmm. I saw you know there were groups there selling jewelry yeah. together, and they obviously were different groups. They have a beautiful store north of Albuquerque, yeah. and many of the pueblos bring their uh, and bring their jewelry there. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's like turquoise stuff. Anyway, I could, I could go out on. But um, there's also the multi-stakeholder hybrid cooperative. Now that's a model, basically where both uh, members and the workers control the business. So. The op there is an option for that to be a worker cooperative. Mm -hmm. Well, you can have a worker cooperative. Let's say the store uh, is, uh, you know, the people that work there are a worker cooperative. But then you also have the consumer aspect where the members, uh, the consumers become members of the mm -hmm. consumer buying group, which are both, you know, together. Uh, now, we have so many different types of cooperatives because really this came out of the populist movement, mm -hmm. you know, the turn of the century, um, late 1800s, early mm -hmm. 1900s. So even uh, credit unions came out of that. Wow. So this is a cooperative financial institution. I'd be curious, um, are there any, and you have the concept of producer cooperatives, um, obviously we're talking about worker cooperatives here, would it, are, are there companies that do a, a hybrid wherein you have worker cooperatives that bundle together, so to speak, in a, in a producer cooperative to, I guess, create a, a larger 
That would be Mondragon. Yeah, that's what I thought that's what they uh, get to that, work. And see, that's yeah. a network of worker cooperatives, and they have all different types of worker cooperatives there. They have manufacturing, which is the you know fundamental basis, economic basis. But then they have a university. They have schools. They have uh, a social bank. healthcare systems. They have banks. Right. Um, all of these things are worker cooperatives and fall under the rubric of Mondragon. Um, uh, uh, Mondragon Corporation. So it's a federation of cooperatives. Right. It's a network. Yeah. Right. right. And we'll get into that in a little yeah. more detail as we go on forward mm -hmm. in this. So, um, and then there is something I participate in when I worked in the corporate world. Okay, I had to do that. Um, <laughs> Employee Stock Option Program Cooperative, or ESOP. Right. So I know exactly what that is. You know, uh, I did not have as many shares as the CFO and the COOs and all that. I, you know, so definitely not uh, a, a, an advocate for uh, greater equality of, of wealth and income. That is for sure. Well, so now we get into the terminology. How does the, the term worker ownership differ right. from the worker cooperative and other types of cooperatives. Worker ownership, you have a huge continuum of you know, very few shares. Somebody at uh, Home Depot may have five shares, right. but they do not par participate in decision making. They have no further rights. There's a right. still the management, all the labor problems, and a corpor corporate ownership where the, the majority of the shares are old, owned by stock uh, you know, mm. shareholders who are investors who are not doing the work. So yes, that's right. It's not the same. Worker ownership, you know, can, is a huge continuum. It can be one if if you get to 100% worker ownership, then you've got a worker cooperative. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. But yeah. uh, all other flavors are not. So I've been involved, like I said, with cooperatives most of my adult life. Uh, worker cooperatives. Um, somebody really kind of turned the light bulb on for me in the 80s, in the 90s. Uh, that they actually solve a problem for um, the for labor for the for the workers, uh, which is that it returns the means of production to the worker, uh, and this is true economic independence and true ownership of the economy. So I became uh, involved at that time, and now I'm the co-chair for the Union Co-op Council for the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives, and I'm the um, and I work to create worker cooperatives here in Los Angeles, and I also did in Las Vegas when I lived there. Um, and uh, the problem, the issue is that that worker cooperatives have to see themselves as part of the larger labor movement, uh, and so consequently, I'm uh, trying to build bridges between the current, um, you know, unions and uh, worker cooperatives. Fantastic, mm -hmm. Eric. Well, I um, grew up in a very conservative family, and I <laughs> ended up. Uh, we all have. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Dark history. <laughs> ended up. Uh, <laughs> Ended up, uh, uh, you know, getting involved in a few different things that radicalized me and switched my direction, I guess you could say. And um, I got very interested in the uh, cooperative movement right around 2006, maybe 2007, um, as a result of just learning a lot of from from actually uh, Noam Chomsky. Uh -huh. mm. And uh, and I had a lot of yeah. a lot of friends who um, gave me uh, some or had had. I had discussion with mostly online um, who were um, a lot further left than I was at the time. I started my uh, leftward spiral, <laughs> I guess you could say. <laughs> upward spiral. Uh, upward spiral, there you go. And um, I, uh, I, at the time, was a very, you know, very big fan of, uh, you know, uh, small businesses, and I realized there's nothing. Yes. Uh, the, 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 the logical conclusion of, of going in that direction was, because uh, the idea was, oh, well, this is all about uh, freedom, and I hate these large corporations. And yeah. uh, the logical conclusion of that was, well, there's no more ethical business than a worker cooperative. I didn't know they existed at the time, and I had friends that raised my awareness of that, and it was like a light bulb switched on. So ever since then, it's been you know, lots of research done on, on, uh, on the topic, and uh, you know, working towards hopefully someday be you know becoming that. So I've been involved in athletics my entire life. I was a college football player. I um, was a shot putter. I also um, got into weightlifting. I, I competed at the national championship for weightlifting. And um, through that process, I got um, closer and closer to the point of becoming a teacher in uh, various disciplines. Uh, and I, you know, decided, hey, you know, I'm going to go into uh, fitness as a as a career, 
and um, I got brought into an organization. Uh, it was a CrossFit gym called mm -hmm. CrossFit Survival, and the uh, person that owned it, um, we, me and her clicked, and um, she was grooming me towards becoming her partner, and I was adamant about becoming a worker cooperative. And she um, fell out of love with CrossFit and fell into love with uh, survival <laughs> and decided to uh, move out to North Carolina for that and left me with the business. Um, we, uh, and, and I brought on uh, two partners so far who are um, trying to help me realize that vision and I have a number of others that, uh, that I'm, I'm grooming on, on a mentorship on, um, on the physical fitness side of things and, uh, and trying to plant the seed of worker ownership. So that's kind of my journey. And you're also uh, interested, you're also part of an international Yes, group? that is correct. So we have what's called the um, Platform Co-op Investment Club. Um, I have a associate that I actually met online through uh, a lot of my radical left. I'm a, I have a lot of, uh, I, a lot of the background of my education came through, uh, uh, came through the, uh, the, what, what is perplexingly to most people called the libertarian left mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. with the, uh, <laughs> with the, the anarchist bunch. And uh, I, I you know, studied a lot on, on Pierre Joseph Proudhon is probably my biggest inspiration in terms of philosophically. And um, he started a school of thought called Mutualism. And uh, I met through a discussion group on, uh, on, on that topic with uh, a guy named Matthew Kropp. And he turned me on to a few different groups that he's involved with in terms of uh, he's got a Vermont club, and I think there are a few other clubs out there right now that are small um, investment clubs that are just like, you know, a couple hundred dollar investments into uh, cooperatives. Mm -hmm. And um, a number of people that are involved are also involved in credit unions. And uh, so we have, I think, 25 or so members right now. So, so it's a, like investing in cooperatives. Yes. So, so this particular does that one mean is like being a member or. So no, it means uh, it means that we're all members who pool together our capital mm. to try to um, uh, and we we make democratic decisions. We run as a cooperative and we invest in cooperatives. I see, I see. And that's um, interesting. the other ones are all local. This is the first of its kind that's international. And our goal is to one of the things that got us um, uh, involved with this thing was uh, that there was a big initiative for um, buy Twitter and yeah. turn it into a cooperative. Uh -huh. And um, oh, really? That was yeah. that was the big thing that we were like, oh well, let's let's try to shoot for that, and a number of others. And you know, platform companies. If for those who are not aware, let's you know think like Uber, for example, ah. and Airbnb. Um, and so what we're looking at is making investments on globally impactful platform companies that um, would be run as worker cooperatives. Interesting. So, thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. for sharing that. Absolutely. Um, and George. Yes. Yeah. Well, my background, actually, uh, interesting enough, with the concept of uh, co-ops actually started when I was very young. I'm second generation Greek American, and uh, my father was, uh, as he used to tell me, that democracy is a Greek word, which yes, means yes. people work together. Yeah, yeah. And I was raised in a small family business, which essentially was by nature a co-op. Yeah. So I grew up in that culture. Mm -hmm. And that, like we're sitting at this table, everything is decided at the table equally. Okay, so that has kind of carried me through my life. But in, when the 2008 crash happened, I was introduced to Professor Wolf's uh, Democracy at Work movement. And ever since then, I've been trying to promote this through my classes. And then outside, I became the San Diego ch uh, coordinator for Democracy at Work. And we met here in LA some time ago. Yes, yes. And uh, at the, so actually we met at the very first at the very first Democracy at Work yes. Los Angeles group meeting that took place at the uh, Santa Monica Public Library. Right. So uh, yeah, so and that's how this discussion uh, began to create a worker cooperative. Right, right. So, so we wanted to actually put it into practical action. Mm -hmm. And so ever since then, and by the way, this I believe July is the anniversary of the movement now for this uh, democracy at work. Yeah, and I think you're right. Beginning last year, it's been spreading kind of like wildfire. It now has. it's actually going global. So it's addressing the institutional crisis of the capitalist system. It's That's not right. being able to provide for all. So democracy at work essentially means that you're putting work in the hands of democracy. You're That's putting right. workers in front 
of the whole process of creating, essentially transforming uh, the capitalist economy. That's right. Okay. Because uh, we have to go to the next system, which yes. we're going to get into. That's one of the main topics we're going to get into going forward and on this show. There's unlimited content, actually, the more we get into this. And, and uh, But this is a start today, you know. And I'm also uh, the original lead of the Pasadena a group of uh, Democracy at Work here in uh, Pasadena. We just started, and we're having monthly meetings to uh, educate one another and people in the community interested about this whole process. And our focus is really on not only to be a part of the community, which I am, <laughs> and not only to be an advocate uh, for education and uh, an activist, which I've always been, <laughs> um, but to always actually put this into practice and, to, and step by step uh, talk to others about how to do that, and we're going to get into that as well. If the workers together decide whether a company leaves town, guess what? They're not going to leave. If you were afforded the opportunity to keep your job here in L.A. or to have one on the outskirts of Shanghai, my guess is, in most cases, you'd, you'd prefer to stay here. You want to deal with the problem of export of jobs, democratize the enterprise, like that. Here's another example. A toxic technology that makes more profits but really fouls the earth. If the company decides, the board of directors, they choose the profitability because that's their pressure. But if the workers themselves decide, would they be interested in more profits? Sure. But they'd also be worried about what they and their spouses and their children and their neighbors have to breathe or drink or eat. And uh, that you're going to see some ecological sensitivity of the sort we never see here. And here the big one. What's the biggest source of income and wealth inequality in America? It's the distribution of profits. It's not the occasional athlete or actress who gets a wild salary. It's the way we distribute the surplus, the profits. In a modern corporation, remember I told you we'd come back to this. In a modern corporation, the board of directors decides how to distribute the surplus. And, surprise, surprise, they give a lot of it to themselves in sky-high executive salary. Suppose a distribution of the surplus were decided democratically. You think the workers democratically would decide to give four or five individuals everything while everybody else has to borrow to put their kid through college? Unlikely. You want to do something about inequality? Let's not have the, the umpteenth war on poverty by the umpteenth president, none of which work. We're in the 50th anniversary of uh, Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty and we got precious little to show. You want to do something about inequality of income and wealth, then don't keep inventing laws and rules to redistribute the wealth and the income. Don't maldistribute it in the first place. Then you won't have to have a debate about which is the better way to redistribute. Don't do that. Don't allow it to be distributed that way in the first place. And a democratic distribution, and what am I asking for? All the workers together produce the profit by their efforts. Nothing would be more obvious than to let all of those who contributed to produce them decide what to do with them. Not only would it undo the inequality that tortures us as a nation, not only would it realize democracy, but it would mean we had finally outgrown and overcome the capitalist organization of enterprises that explains the rise, the decline, and the crisis of this system.